Welcome back. And this is uh, one of my favorite chapters. There's a couple things in here that I think uh, are instructive about Jesus that are um, very helpful. And, and just the tone of it. If you remember last week, we kind of finished with, you know, Paul literally not knowing like what sentence he's going to get, death or freedom. And he literally can't decide which he prefers. Can you imagine that? He said it'd actually be better by far to depart and be with the Lord. You know, so I wonder if we can know the Lord the way Paul did uh, to feel that way. And we're going to touch on some of those thoughts again tonight. But we're going to get one of the, one area of Scripture, it's one of the most theological areas of Scripture that I think is so incredibly helpful. I find myself uh, gravitating to this area of Scripture with so many other parts of the Bible, coming back to this as a reference point. So I look forward to uh, going through that with you guys here tonight. So let's get to it, and let's open in prayer, and we'll begin. So our Father God, we come to you, and we thank you for the day behind us, Lord, and we pray that you found us faithful to the callings that you've given us, Lord, and exercising the gifts that you've given us. And Lord, uh, just the very things we're going to hear Paul talking about how to walk out this Christian life and this Christian faith, I pray that um, we would learn tonight, Lord, we would receive it with open hearts, and we would just examine our own lives, Lord, and see if we're being the witness and the testimony of your goodness and your salvation uh, that you have us to be. So Lord, we love you and we dedicate this hour to learning more about you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so again, as we concluded chapter one, as um, you know, Paul was talking about that you know, to him to live will be for Christ, to die would actually be personal gain of his, and and he talks about, you know, we're going to share in some of these sufferings with him. So he's going to call us to unity in that. <clears throat> and he finished chapter one by saying that because of this greatness of resurrection of life after death, he talks about let our conduct now in this world be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Um, so uh, we can be useful for the kingdom of God before he takes us home even if it means suffering for his name's sake. Now, um, he finished the last verse talking about having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. So that conflict, people kind of have different ideas about the conflict he's referring back to. I happen to think he's referring back to his own personal conflict that he just discussed about, do I want to live or die? You know, uh, he, he's wrestling inside with this potential of going to be with the Lord, or am I going to go and serve you more? And so because he ended with that in chapter one, and of course, Paul didn't write in chapters, he's just writing one flowing letter. Uh, chapter two is picking up with that same thought. So let's go ahead and begin in chapter two. You can see I actually have my own glasses for a change. <laughs> Yay, tired of looking at those, those lady glasses I've been wearing. So uh, chapter 2, verse 1 says, therefore, thank, I always count on you for that. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, so therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ. So what's the consolation? Well, the last sentence that he uttered, he talked about a conflict, right? So with the conflict, he says there's consolation. He says, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit... If any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. So he's referring back to this conflict in his heart that he just brought up. And he says, you see the same conflict in me and you hear is in me. He finished chapter one with that. And now he's talking about consolation. He's saying, even with the potential of death, why do I have joy with the potential of death? He's saying, because there's consolation in Christ. There's consolation in Christ. There's comfort of love. There's fellowship of the Spirit. That would mean fellowship, you fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit of God. There's fellowship of the Spirit. There's affection. There's mercy. So with all of that, Paul's saying, listen, I might die, but I'm good. I'm good. Now here's your thing. 
fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Okay? Why? Paul's living in a day where Christians are going to be dying all the time for their faith. Okay? So he's calling them to a like-mindedness. He's saying, look at my example. My, if I lose my life, that's fine. Okay, that's going to be fine if I lose my life. The important thing is holding on to the testimony. Okay, because we've, now we've seen, Paul didn't see this yet, but we have seen that every time there's martyrdom of Christians, every time Christians are persecuted even unto death, the church actually grows from that. That's why we have that famous saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Every time our blood gets spilt on the ground, it seems to grow the church even more. Why? It, it's a testimony. It's a real testimony. Suffering in ser- serenity and suffering is a stirring testimony of what you believe in. Um, I think of the Roman centurion. That's part of the crucifixion of Christ. He's participating and making sure that man dies. He, he might have been overseeing it. He might have been the one driving the nails in his body. I don't know what his role was there. But he never heard Jesus preach. He never saw Jesus do a miracle. He never heard a sermon. He never was fed by him, never dined with him. All he did was watch Jesus suffer. And that made him say, surely that man was a righteous man. Some of your versions say, he said, surely that man was the son of God. How, what did he see? What, what, what testified to his heart to the truth of the identity of Christ when all he saw him was suffer? So Paul now, as he shares in the suffering to Christ, he's saying, listen, be consoled, be comforted, okay? Continue fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, continue infection and mercy, And with all of that, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, okay? So here he's saying, I'm showing you how to suffer, be like-minded with that. And he's about to enter into that section that I said is so valuable to us. And as he just said, for us to be like-minded with him, he's now going to say an even higher call. He's going to ask us to be like-minded with Christ. And we'll see that in just a moment. Now... This ability to have this comfort, this fellowship, this affection, this mercy, this consolation, all of this serves as a testimony, and it's a call to unity in the church, because unity in the church is directly reflective of the functionality of the church. Without unity in the church, there's no functionality in the church. Functionality in the church is what makes the church useful to the world. And that usefulness turns into the witness of the church. So it's going to start with unity. So the call for unity is a call to functionality, a call, which is a call to usefulness, which is a call to witness. Um, <clears throat> Mahatma Gandhi is famous for saying, as he observes the behavior of the Christian, he says, I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So here's somebody that never received the grace of Christ, and here's his statement on that. I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. There's such a difference between your Christians and your Christ. So you can see how the lack of unity speaks very loudly, just like unity speaks very loudly. Brendan Manning said, the single greatest cause of atheism in the world is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That's when an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. So it's, it's a witness, it's a testimony. And I don't know who to quote on this. I know I've heard this and I love it, but I don't know where I got it from. But it's a saying that says, hey, there's five gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the believer. And most people read the believer to decide if they ever want to read Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Your life today, just think about the day that you just spent. That was your message about your Christ. If they know you're a Christian, they were learning about your Christ from how you conducted your life today. Whether it was a good day or a bad day, both of those speak to other people about your Christ. Okay, where there's a lack of accord, there's a presence of discord. Discord does not allow clarity 
in the message of God. So Paul here, as with many other places, uses that word unity. There's got to be a like-mindedness and a unity amongst us. Verse 3, he says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. So he warns us against selfish ambition and vain conceit. That's the word vain that Solomon uses over and over again in Ecclesiastes about you want to pursue money, you're going to find it to be a vanity of vanities. You want to pursue position, you're going to find it to be a vanity of vanities. You're going to find all pursuits that are not pursuits of God to end up being vain. So he uses that word here to say, avoid selfish ambition or vain conceit. And the contrast of that is a lowliness of mind, esteeming others as better than themselves. The very moment you think you're better than someone else is the very moment you're wrong about yourself. The very moment you're wrong about yourself is the very moment you can't be right about God anymore. You are the walking billboard for the truth of God. And if you have a superiority attitude, now you're mispositioned in representing God. You're mispositioned in representing God. And Paul is leading us to embrace a truth that he's going to start in verse 5 in a moment. But he's, before he introduces this to us, he's warning us against selfish ambition and vain conceit. The antidote to this error is given here by Paul. He says, esteem others as better than yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to somehow think, I'm no good, everybody's better than me. It's this word, esteem. You give credit to people as people that are better than yourself, and you let your conduct be the result of that esteem that you're giving other people. And this is played out for us throughout the New Testament by our leaders, by the apostles, by Jesus Christ. So if we esteem others as our equals, we're not likely to serve them. To act godly towards them would, be, would more naturally come from esteeming them as better than us. Selfish ambition and conceit are anti-gospel. Selfish ambition and conceit are anti-gospel. Where there is selfish ambition... There is no kingdom of God since God, God's kingdom is the ambition of the gospel. So if you have selfish ambition, there's no kingdom of God that you're participating in because true ambition is the gospel of God. Where there is conceit, there's no Christ since cr conceit takes credit to self where that credit was due to Christ. Selfish ambition has in it a bonding to conceit. Selfish ambition is a surefire path to loneliness because nobody's going to wake up tomorrow morning like-minded with your selfish ambitions. You're literally going to be on an island by yourself. Nobody's waking up tomorrow saying, I really hope I can help so-and-so fulfill their selfish ambition. You're literally going to be alone on that journey. And as you pursue selfish ambition and nobody else is pursuing your selfish ambition, you're going to find that you're getting further and further removed from like-mindedness and community with other people. The same with vain conceit. Nobody's waking up hoping they can serve you in feeding your ego today. So if your desire today is to feed your ego, to lift yourself up, you're all alone in the world wanting to do that. Nobody else has that ambition. Okay? Nobody else is trying to do that. So it's a surefire path to... Um, loneliness, isolation, um, and so forth. Selfish ambition desires success for the purpose of being seen. Godly ambition desires success for the purpose of being of service. So selfish ambition is look at me, look at me. Godly ambition is how can I serve you? How can I be of service to you? Conceit points to self Humility points to the Savior. Conceit says, look at me. Humility says, look at him. It's look what I did versus look what he did on our behalf. 
So Paul vehemently warns against this. Conceit builds a church around a man. Humility builds a church around the son of man. Okay? So Paul warns us against it. Um, one of the verses that I love to kind of check my own spirit and see where my ambition's coming from is Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Selfish ambition is being ruled by want, right? Conceit is being ruled by want. Psalm 23, 1, David says, listen, the Lord is my shepherd. And because he's such a good shepherd, I shall not want. The wantiness of things that are not of godly ambition are, are squelched through being shepherded well by the Lord. Now, when I say being shepherded well by the Lord, I don't mean, is he doing a good job shepherding? I trust me, he is. The question is, are you receiving that shepherding? Selfish ambition blocks the shepherding of Christ. Vain conceit blocks the shepherding of Christ. You're shepherding yourself. You have your own agenda. So Paul starts by saying, look, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And that's, listen, that's kind of, that's kind of a benefit to me. I'm going to go and be with the Lord. That's great. But if I go on living in the body, that's for your benefit. I'll go on serving you and all of that. Now, try to be like-minded like that. Try to have that mindset about you. Serve the Lord without fear. And as you serve the Lord without fear, if worse comes to worse and you have to lose your head for it, good for you. Go be with the Lord. If not, continue on serving. Continue on serving. Have that type of ambition, that type of like-mindedness because he's about to point you somewhere higher. Now, I wrote down a little, little tiny poem from Charles Meggs about serving others. And it's super easy to memorize. It's super easy um, to grasp. It's in the notes if you want it for later. It's called Others. And he says, Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others so that I might live for thee. Living for others is living for Christ, okay? So other people are the, are the model of how can I serve the Lord? He shows you people, right? How can I serve you, Lord? He's going to present you with people, okay? All right. Now, verse 4 says, let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, as he establishes that, and we're about to enter into one of my very favorite uh, pieces of scripture. And as Paul's preparing us for that, before we talk about it, I want you to think in terms of the person of Christ and the position of Christ. The person of Christ and the position of Christ. Because Jesus Christ will say things like, I and the Father are one. That's the position of Christ. He's one with the Father. And then he'll say, the Father is greater than me. That's the, that's the position of Christ. That's not the person of Christ. That's the position of Christ. And what Paul's about to get into now is the position of Christ in these next few verses. He willingly submits himself to humanity, and you're going to see that in these verses, and come lower positionally than the Father while maintaining the personhood of, uh, of uh, equal personhood of the Father. Okay. And, and there's going to be a fancy term called hypostatic union. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. So person versus p position. Now, as to his person, Christ always was and is equal with God, the Father. Jesus' personal equality with God, he never surrendered. It is his positional equality that we're going to talk about in these verses. Now, verse 5. <clears throat> Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So first he gave his, his, the thought of, hey, I'm willing to die for Christ and I'm going to be super happy if that happens. Otherwise, I'm going to be released. I'm going to serve you. So have that mind. There, there's like an earthly mindset there. But now he's going to say that's going to require a humility about you. So how do we develop that humility in you? He's not going to point to himself here. Now he's going to point to Christ. And he's going to say, now let this mind be in you, 
which was also in Christ Jesus. So what mind was in Christ Jesus? Well, here's how Paul paints that picture. He says, who, being in the form of God, okay, being in the very form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay? So some of your versions say he didn't consider his equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, you'll never see Jesus saying, do what I said because I'm God, like we like to do as a parent, right? You do what I said because I'm dad or I'm mom, right? Jesus never did that. He never considered his equality with God something to grasp at, but rather he made himself of no reputation. So I want you to see these contrasts that are being drawn. He's in the very form of God, and he made himself of no reputation, Okay, so it's talking about this incredible difference between who he is and what he agreed to become. Okay, so he didn't consider Robert to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant. Now, as far as adults in any century, the bond servant, this is somebody who has to sell himself into your service because of his debts. So now he's your servant. Okay, so Jesus Christ, it says, he didn't just become a human. That's what we like to say, Jesus became a man. Paul's saying what kind of man he became. He became the bondservant man. This is the El Shaddai of the Old Testament. This is the El Shaddai that the temple shook and smoke was coming from the temple when Isaiah caught a glimpse of him in his throne room. And angels were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That one now becomes a bondservant. Positionally, personally the same. Okay, Positionally he's changing, personally he's the same. So it says, he became a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. Okay, You don't say that about regular men, right? You don't go, that man was found in appearance as a man. It's like, that is as redundant as you can be, right? But if you're formally God... And now you're found in appearance as a man. It says he humbled himself and became obedient. Now that's remarkable to me. Because the whole goal of my life is to be found obedient to him. And now this is saying he became obedient. And you would say, who in the world could he become obedient to? And the answer is not going to be in the form of a person. He's not becoming obedient to a person. It says he became obedient to death. The very curse that he had to put on Adam and Eve for their disobedience, now he becomes obedient to that curse. Okay, he's become obedient even to the point of death. And this isn't the death of being in your rocking chair at 85 years old and just falling asleep peacefully and going to sleep. It says, even the death of the cross, which was a simple way of saying the slowest, most torturous way he could suffer and die devised by man. Okay, today, if we um, execute somebody with an injection, we sterilize the needle, right? We want to make sure there's no germs whatsoever in the guy we're about to kill, right? Okay, they didn't consider that with crucifixion, okay? They didn't wash the nails. They didn't polish the cross, okay? Um, he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now the king of all the therefores in scripture is right here. So you ready for this? Therefore. All right. We need more training on that. All right, listen. There, you always have to understand what comes before the therefore if you're going to understand what came after the therefore, right? So what did this say? Very form of God, not close to the form of God, or something like the form of God. He is the very form of God. He becomes a man, not just any man, not like he said, I'm going to come and be your king, sit in, seated on a throne for you to serve me. That would be humiliating for God to do. But he took the form of a bondservant and became obedient even to the curse of death, and that death being the death of the cross. Because of he was at the highest spot possible, and now he brought himself to the lowest spot possible. That's the picture that's being painted there. He was 
as high as you can go, and he brought himself to as low as he could go. That's what this therefore is about. Because he was willing to do that, therefore, God also has highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. Okay, now, today we say that name is Jesus, right? Paul's going to say that name is Jesus, but he's going to say it in a shocking way. Because when he says the name above every name, every one of anybody that read that that knew the Old Testament would say, that name is Yahweh. That is the name that's above every name. We will not pronounce that name. We will not put the vowels in that name. We will not say that name. And if we write that name with just the four letters with no vowels, we destroy the pen afterwards. Because that name is holy. That's the name that's above every name. And so now Paul says, now because he was so willing to humble himself, even to death on a cross, God gave him the name that's above every name. And here's what Paul does with that. He says that at the name of Jesus. Paul's clearly equating Jesus with Yahweh here. Because before this, nobody would said Jesus is the name that's above every name. Okay? Jesus is the Yahweh name. That at the name of Jesus. Now, how do I know that's what Paul's getting at? Watch what he does. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven. Okay, this isn't the people that have passed on and went to heaven. This is the angelic realm that's up there, both the ones that didn't fall and the ones that did fall. You're going to see all of them are going to bow the knee to Christ. Okay? The name that's above every name, that at his name, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on the earth, and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now I want to bring your attention to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. I'm going to start in verse 14. It says this, Thus says the Lord. And your Bible should have Lord in all capital letters. What is your Bible telling you when it writes Lord in all capitals instead of just having the L capitalized? It's the Yahweh name. Okay? They don't want to write the Yahweh name, so when, they, when the original has Yahweh's name, they just put Lord in all caps to represent that name. Okay? This is in all caps. Thus says the Lord, thus says Yahweh. It says, The labor of Egypt and merchandise of Cush and of the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over to you and they shall be yours. They shall walk behind you. They shall come over in chains and they shall bow down to you. They will make supplication to you saying, Surely God is in you and there is no other. There is no other God. Here's the Egyptians that are going to come to the realization that the God of Israel is the true God, and there is no other God. Verse 15, truly you are God who hide yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them. They shall go in confusion together who are makers of idols. Israel shall be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed or disgraced forever and ever. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. Just think of the other planets all around the earth. Does, do any of them look like they're intended to be inhabited? Now look at the earth. Can you find anywhere in the earth where there's not, it's not teeming with life? Why are we so vastly different than our nearest planet, Mars? This says God made the earth to be inhabited. He created this one to have inhabitants on it. I, he says this, I am the Lord and there is no other. Are you hearing that? Because this is going to be play into this. I am the Lord and there is no other. I've not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I did not say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. 
Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you who have escaped from the nations. They have no knowledge who carry the wood of their carved image and pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord, and there is no other God beside me, a just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Are we getting the point? Okay. God is the, the, he's God most high. He's a just God and a Savior. There's no other God but him. And then he says in 22, look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. Think of how shocking that is to Isaiah's uh, audience. They thought God was just a God of the Jews, right? But way back in Isaiah, you always hear this is for the coastlands, this is for the nations. Here we say um, the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. You getting the theme? Okay. I have sworn by myself. I love the predicament of God. He can only swear by himself, right? There's nothing higher to swear by, okay? He said, I've sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. See if this sounds familiar. That to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue take an oath, which is confessing. So what did Paul do with that language? He says, take that and know that Jesus is the one that they're going to bow to, right? It says that to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue's going to take an oath. Paul says he was given that name that's above every name, the name that said there is no God but me. There is no God but me. And to me, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And Paul says Jesus is given that name and to him, every knee will bow and to him, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in other words, Christ is not in opposition to his father in taking that name. It's to the glory of his father that he takes that name. Does that make sense? Okay. Massively important text of scripture. So I mentioned this term hypostatic union. Okay, this is the one that you can use, use this term when you just want to sound smart at parties, right? Okay. So what does it mean? The hypostatic union of Christ is the union of his two natures. He's got a divine nature, he's got a human nature. Now one of the, 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 the mistakes that we make in talking about this is we quickly say Jesus is fully God and fully man. And if any of you major in math, you're gonna say, wait a minute, once you're fully one thing, you can't be fully anything else. Literally, once you're fully one thing, you can be zero of everything else, right? Because you're full, full means full, okay? But Jesus' two natures that exist within him where we have one nature. What's our nature? Human nature, right? So he's got that. That's what Paul's celebrating in Philippians 2, that he became a man. He was found in appearance as a man. He has a human nature, but that human nature is separate from his divine nature. And he has a divine nature. This is where he says, listen, if you see me, you've seen the Father. There's, you can't differentiate between the two of us. And the, the Jews of the Old Testament understood this because they had appearances. They knew two things. You can't see God and live. You've heard that, right? And then they knew they had appearances of God in the Old Testament where they would say, we've just seen God. Why aren't we dying? So what is it? I, I, there's an angel of the Lord that appears to Samson's parents and they say, we have just seen God. Uh, Jacob wrestles with God. There's these appearances of God. Abraham meets with God uh, tangibly in the form of a man, yet the Bible says nobody can see God and live. So the Jew understood that in their monotheism, they never, never strayed from the claim that we are monotheists. We believe in this one God. Yet they understood there's this invisible God, and then there's this manifestation of him that appears to us. And they're not one and the same as far as we can see the manifestation and not die, but we can't see the invisible God. Okay, so, so they had an understanding. This is, this is, this is coming from ancient literature that, that where they're talking about, we know this one God will appear visibly to us, but there's, there's some manifestation in him that nobody could ever see. Okay, and what do they call that manifestation God in the Old Testament? Most often, if not always, 
you'll have a capital A, angel of the Lord. You've seen that term many times, right? Angel of the Lord. And you can trace the behavior of the angel Lord and see that he says things and does things that can only be true of God. Quick example, because I see a couple of you with your eyebrows up right now, okay? Angel of the Lord appears to Samson's parents to tell him, hey, you're going to give birth to a boy and he's going to be a Nazarite all the days of his life and all of this. And, um, and when Manoah, Samson's father, hears this birth announcement, he says, let me prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord says something weird. He says, you can prepare it, but I'm not going to eat it. So can you imagine inviting somebody to dinner? And they say, yeah, make dinner, but I'm not going to eat it, right? But he, he prepares the goat, and as he goes to put it on the altar of sacrifice, the angel of the Lord jumps on the altar of sacrifice and ascends to heaven in the flame. What, what's that all about? Okay, he's saying this, that goat ain't your sacrifice. I'm your sacrifice. Who's the only one that can say that? Jesus Christ. And guess when they see that, guess what Manoah's parents say? We have just seen God. We're going to die. And the other one says, why would he appear to us to announce something to us if he intended to kill us? Okay, so they have this confusion. We know that's God, yet we know we're not dead. So they had this understanding of these manifestations like that. Well, in a similar sense, Jesus comes with this divine nature and this human nature, okay? And in his human nature, he is 100% human. The Bible will say things of him like this. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. He's human. When they whipped him, he bled. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He got angry. Well, God gets angry too. But he got hungry, thirsty, tired. Okay? He experienced humanity. That's why the Bible says he can be your sympathetic high priest because he experienced your life. He experienced your emotions. He experienced these things with you. Okay? Yet he is God. If he doesn't like the weather, he'll change it by speaking to it. Okay? If the sea's a little rough, he'll tell it to chill out and it'll listen. Okay? He'll take a walk across the sea if he wants to, right? Okay? Somebody's upset that their child just died. He'll get them up. Okay? He's God. In fact, when John the Baptist is experiencing a crisis in faith because he's locked in prison and he sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus, are you really the one or should we wait for somebody else? Jesus' answer to that is, go tell him what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. What language is Jesus using there? The language of Exodus chapter 4, where Moses is like, don't send me, Lord, I can't speak well. And the Lord says, who made your mouth? Who makes man mute or speaking, deaf or hearing, blind or seeing, lame or walking? Isn't it I, the Lord? So John says, are you really the one? He goes, tell him the blind are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the lame are walking. I'm doing what only the God of Exodus can do. That'll be his answer, right? And then he'll throw this in and tell him, blessed is the one that doesn't get offended because of me. In other words, I ain't going to change your circumstance. You're staying in jail and you're actually going to get beheaded for it. I'm not changing your circumstance, but don't be offended. Because he'll tell the crowd, John's the greatest on the earth, but the least in the kingdom is greater than him. So what's the nicest thing Jesus can do? Go let him be greater in the kingdom because he can't be on the earth right? So in other words, death doesn't bother Paul, death doesn't bother Jesus, and it's hard for us to grasp, but death shouldn't bother us as well. What should bother us is those who don't have that salvation, right? Okay. All right. I told you that was wonderful. Now, do you know that that section started with, have this mind in you, that was also in Christ Jesus, Here's the mind in Christ Jesus. I'm God, but I'm coming to serve you. Okay? I'm a king, but instead of sending people to die for me, I'm a king that's going to go and die for you. He says, that should be your mental attitude walking through life. If he can be that high and do it, what's our excuse? Okay? So have that mind that was also in Christ Jesus. You see that most effectively in John 13. In John 13... 
It's hard for us to imagine the awkwardness of this Last Supper scene when they're actually eating and finishing up eating and nobody has done the very common job of washing the feet before the meal. So they're eating the Last Supper with dirty feet. Why? Because none of them will say, I'm the one that should be doing that. If anybody, it should be him or him or him, but it's not me. I'm not the one that should be washing the feet. So they, because of that pride, they're all eating the Last Supper with dirty feet. So how do you think they feel when Jesus rises up from that supper, takes off his rabbinical robe of authority, goes and girds himself with a servant's towel, and then they see him take out a basin, take out a pitcher of water, start pouring the water in the pitcher. It's got to be horrifying for them. What is he doing? Go take the basin from him. No, you go take the basin from him. What's going on? Then he sits down and kneels in front of them and starts washing their feet. Okay? And as he washes their feet, he says, I'm doing this as an example for you because you call me Lord and you call me Master and you're right for doing so because such I am. And if I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, then you ought to be washing each other's feet as well. This I've done as an example for you to follow. Have that mindset that was also in Christ Jesus. Okay? And then he sends Judas out to betray him with clean feet. Isn't that amazing? Okay? Now, have that mindset in you. You know, in Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Where have you ever heard of a king with that type of attitude? Okay? Imagine coming to serve your king. He says, I didn't come here to be served. I ain't your king to be served. I'm here to serve you. All right. When it says that Jesus was given a name that's above every name. He's given a name that's above every name. In other words, he didn't take the name for himself. He didn't even take the priesthood for himself. The Bible says that nobody takes the priesthood unto themselves that has to be given to them. And you see in Psalm 110 verse 4, God saying to his son before he ever became a man, he says, I have sworn and I will not change my mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So even the priesthood was given to Jesus. He didn't take it for himself. And so Jesus, here it says he was given a name. It's above every name. He's given this name. And that's an anti-Babel statement. What was the sin of Babel? We will make a name for ourselves, right? We're going to make a name for ourselves. Here's the king of glory, and it's said of him, he was given a name. Okay, God gave, his father gave him this name. It's an anti babel statement, and God gives him the name above every name. Have that mind in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Now, this verse has caused confusion and debate. What does it mean to work out your salvation? Okay. Could the same man who wrote to the Ephesians, you're saved by grace through faith alone, not of works, now be saying to you to do works for your salvation. Do you think that's possible? That would be very contradictory, wouldn't it? Okay. So what does it mean to work out your salvation with fear and trembling? This is the workout that Paul speaks of when he says that he trained himself as an athlete. He worked out as an athlete spiritually to, to be an apostle. You know, he says, I don't beat against the air. I'm training for warfare here, okay? So working out your salvation has the idea of exercising your salvation. Work it out. Don't just be saved and sit in a lazy boy chair the rest of your life. Work out that salvation because you're not saved for your benefit only. 
You're saved so that many people will benefit for your salvation. So go exercise your salvation. Go work it out with fear and trembling. Why with fear and trembling? Because the next verse says, because it's God who works in you in two ways. He's going to work in you both to will to do his good pleasure and to do for his good pleasure. So he says he's working in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So upon salvation, God's going to create a will in you to do his works for, to do his works. Okay? And he's going to equip you to do them. So imagine if God saves. Now this says, listen, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because it's God who's working in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. The same Ephesians verses I quoted a little while ago, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. You're saved by grace through faith alone, not of works, so nobody can boast. And then it says, because you're Christ's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared beforehand for you to walk in. So Paul's crystal clear. You're saved by, through, alone, not of, so nobody can boast. But, we, but works are, are a... Uh, works are an outward manifestation of the inward reality of your salvation. So if you have the inward reality of salvation, you're going to have the outward works that go along with it that did not contribute to your salvation, but they come with your salvation. That's why Martin Luther said, you're saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. It's always accompanied with good works. It's always accompanied with good works. Okay? Okay. Why? Because God works in you to will it. He's putting the want to in you. He's, he's working you to will to do for his good pleasure, and he's working you to do for his good pleasure. Okay? The willing and the doing, he's working in you. So if there's nothing that you desire to do for the kingdom of God, what happened to God's working in you, both the will and the, the, will and the desire and the ability to do for his good pleasure? Why? Because this is kingdom building. Buildings don't get built without anybody working on them. Okay? And so he, he equips us for the works of ministry. And he said in the last letter that we studied, in Ephesians, he said, the gifts that he gives us, he'll give the church gifts. And the gifts that he gives them are workers. He says, here, church, here's your gifts. I'm going to give you pastors. I'm going to give you evangelists. I'm going to give you teachers. I'm going to give you people that will work in the people that show up for church so the people that show up for church can go out and be Christ's hands and feet in the world. Okay? So he gives the church these certain groups of people and they're to raise you up and equip you to go and do the works. Not that they don't do the works too, but their main job is to equip the larger body to go and do the work. Okay? Okay? And the apostles asked Jesus the question, what's the works that we're to do? And Jesus said this, the work for you to do is to believe on the one that God has sent. So what's the work for you to do? Create belief in people. Create belief in people. Okay? All right. Um, verse 14. Do all things without complaining. Now you're like, now I'm out. <laughs> I was with you about dying, losing my head, all that. But if I'm going to do it without complaining, you're asking too much, right? <laughs> Did you see my Facebook? Give me a break. All right. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of... Right in the middle of it, of what? A crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Now, the part of this I want to talk about is this, us being in the midst of, of a crooked and perverse generation. Do you think you're ever going to meet anybody that goes, I'm 
I'm participating in that crooked and perverse generation. Okay, I'm looking to build crookedness and perverseness, right? Nobody thinks they're doing that. So how did it get crooked and how did it get perverse? Okay? How did it get crooked and perverse? Well, you know, working with teenagers for 28 years, you start to see things, right? And what I see in kids that go this way or this way and everywhere in between is they n never can pinpoint the time that they began to embrace the perversions and the crookedness. God tells Moses this, I'm laying out a line for you. Do not depart from it to the right or to the left. You stay on the line, right? If he stays on the line, he's going to have clear communication and contact with God. But things happen where you go, well, nobody has to know. Nobody's getting hurt by this. Okay, I'm only going to do it once. All right, it's really no big deal. I've been walking on the line a long time. I deserve to do this. And so you take that step off the line. And now that you're here off the line, the next more crooked and perverse thing, which is here, is only this far away now, when before it was that far away. And when it was that far away, you thought, I ain't doing that. But now that you're only this far away, you go, Nobody will know. I'm not hurting anybody. Okay? One time won't hurt me. And now you're here. And this is who you are. This line is getting crooked. Okay? And now you're just this far from saying, I never thought I would be this person. I never in a million years thought that this would be me. In fact, I remember actually criticizing people like this. Kind of thinking, what's wrong with them? And now I'm that person. And I don't know how I got here. Well, nobody goes from here to here in one decision. Why? It's too crooked, too perverse. I would never do it. But compromise after compromise is how you end up making your line crooked. Okay? So we've got to reset ourselves through the word of God every, every day. Every day. Reset ourselves through the word of God. Get back on the line. Okay? I talked about when we were talking about uh, Ephesians, this word sin. What is this word sin? It's the word harmartia. It's an archery term. Remember? It means you miss the mark. Well, if that means there was a mark for you to hit. What do we call that mark you're to hit in archery? Bullseye, right? So there's a bullseye. And the way you can guarantee you miss the bullseye if you never find out that there's a bullseye to hit. How are you ever going to hit it if you don't know it's there? It's hard enough to hit it when you know it's there, right? Okay, so we have to know what we're aiming at. We have to know that there's purpose in our pursuits and that God has drawn the line to the kingdom of God and said, walk this way. And then when we say, but I don't want to, I want to walk this way. Crooked line, crooked line, crooked line. He says, so now the Christian in the midst of a generation that is so crooked and perverse, you're to stand in the midst of that. Why? Because God made you light. And light goes undefeated with darkness. The only way light doesn't defeat darkness is if the light never gets flicked on. So you stand in the midst of this crooked and perverse generation as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, holding fast to it. Verse 17. Verse 17. Yes. And if I'm being poured out on the sacrifice and service of your faith, some of your versions say as a drink offering, even though that should be in italics, it wasn't in the original. He's being poured out on the on the sacrifice and service of your faith, okay? He said, listen, if my life has got to be spent in the service of your faith, okay, I'm glad and I rejoice with you, with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. 
Let's be willing to be poured out for one another and experience the gladness. The gladness of saying, listen, I'm working out my salvation. God's working me to will and to do for his good pleasure. I'm willing to be poured out as a sacrifice for you. And then you realize in this community, they're willing to be poured out for you as well. That becomes a pretty cool way to live your life. It's a pretty cool community to be a part of. 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Opposed to what? Right? Opposed to being killed. He said, listen, I'm going to send Timothy to you. And here's what he says about Timothy. Paul was talking about he's willing to die in service to the people. But in the meantime, Paul was faithful to raise up somebody else. That's a key thing to do, correct? Raising up other people that when you're done doing what you're doing, either through death or old age or whatever the case may be, you're struck and sick or whatever, you've raised somebody up to do that. As Paul is doing all this for the church, he was faithful to raise up Timothy, right? Now as he says, listen, I might die, but I have Timothy to send to you. You know his proven character, that he was like a son with his father as he served me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Okay? So Paul's faithful to raise somebody else up. As he's building churches and, and raising up elders and doing all that stuff, he's not just doing it in isolation. Timothy, come with me. Timothy, see how this goes. Okay, why? I found him to be like-minded. So now you see his call for this like-mindedness. Oh, but people are persecuting us. Yes, I'm actually writing this from prison, awaiting my sentence right now. I get that. But guess what? All they can do is kill me. That's it. Okay? Our Lord taught us this. Do not fear man who can only kill your body. But I'll tell you who you should fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has the authority to cast your soul into hell. Yes, I say, fear him. Okay? Okay, so Paul's saying, listen, I know this stuff can get you killed, but Jesus has got your back because, as Paul says to the Corinthians, in the twinkling of an eye upon your death, you'll be with the Lord. The twinkling of an eye. That's pretty quick. Okay? So be faithful. Paul was faithful. Did he raise up another that could take his place when the time came? This helps Paul be ready to die. If he didn't raise up a Timothy, I think this letter would sound different. I think he'd say, listen, pray for me that I get out of here because if I die, this whole thing's sinking here, right? He says, no, I've raised up Timothy. This is all going to be fine because I was faithful to raise up Timothy for you. Now we have another name coming to us, Epaphroditus. Uh, 25, yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who... And the one who ministered to my need. So look how valuable he is to Paul. He says, he's my brother. He's my fellow worker. He's my soldier. He's the one that ministered to my need. But he's your messenger. So what does Paul do with this decision? He's four important things to me and one important thing to you. And he says, since, but since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. So I'm going to send him to you. He says, listen, I really need him. But he loves you, and he heard that when he was sick, you really cared for him. So he's urging me to let him go to you. So I'm going to let him go to you. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful." Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Why? Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death. 
not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. In other words, Paul has two people that an advisor would say, don't do this, you'll get yourself killed. A doctor would say, don't do this, you're getting yourself sick unto death. And they say, no, this is service unto the Lord. If the Lord takes us, he takes us. If he doesn't, 